Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've just come off of a pretty significant time in the church year, haven't we? You got <coughs> Advent in which we're anticipating the celebration of Christmas. We had Christmas, which is a major thing unto itself, of course. You had Epiphany. And then Last Sunday, we even had the, the baptism of our Lord. We have all of these major things, and these deal with those big, major themes of the Bible as well. The themes of Jesus coming as Savior, overcoming sin, delivering us from death to a life everlasting. They, these things deal with Jesus claiming us as his own in baptism and being revealed as the Savior of the world and, and of all kinds of people. So we get these big, big themes, and I think sometimes, because we focus so heavily on those, we forget, you know what, Jesus actually cares about my everyday as well. He cares about my, my everyday life. All of those little things happening in my life, he cares about that. I think Ever so often, this shows up in prayer. I've heard it in the prayers of confirmation students. I've heard it in sometimes my own kids' prayers. Adults, sometimes, even my own prayers on occasion. This idea that God only cares about those big things sometimes shows up. It, it kind of sounds like this. In the, in the prayer, somebody will be asking God for some kind of minor blessing. It might be you know, a snow day to get off of school, or it might be um, asking that your favorite food, you might be able to get that that week, or that you might get a, a, a raise at your job. And you'll hear somebody start asking God for this, and, and they'll almost kind of cut themselves off and backtrack, like, Oh, I didn't really mean that. I mean, I, I should be praying about important things. And so they'll start like piling on things that they think are big and important to follow that up because they, uh, I shouldn't really be bother, bothering God, bugging God with these little things. But you know, it, it, it's okay to pray about those little things. In fact, the Lord wants us to do that. He does care about not just the big things, but those little things too. Our theme during the season of Epiphany is uh, rediscovering Jesus. And what we discover here is, yeah, he cares about those major big things, but he cares about the little things too. We see that in today's gospel reading. <laughs> if, you were a, uh, if you were the promoter for Jesus... And you wanted him to have just a major splash coming onto the scene. Okay, his first miracle. What's it going to be? It's going to be, well, it's got to be something big, right? You want people to know about this thing, and you know, you want them to take Jesus seriously. What, what kind of miracle should he have? Let's think about that. Maybe, maybe he could give sight to the blind or... Heal somebody who's sick. Uh, maybe, maybe the lame man, he can heal him and have him walk and jump and all of that. Or, or maybe, let's just go all out. Raise somebody from the dead. But what's Jesus' first miracle? <laughs> Turning water into wine. Compared to those things, that seems pretty small, pretty insignificant, doesn't it? It seems kind of out of place. We got all these big Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. You know, by his wounds you will be healed. And, and you know, we have this prayer, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And Jesus, of course, deals with sin, death, and the devil, those big three enemies of humanity. But the, the first miracle is water into wine. Sounds more like a parlor trick than a, a big miracle, kind of, doesn't it? And I think that's part of the point. The Lord is saying, yeah, yeah, the Messiah came in order to deal with sin, death, and the devil. But you know what? That's not just, that's not it. Even those little things, he cares about that. 
I love how this all unfolds in John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Jesus and his disciples are invited to the wedding at Cana in Galilee. We don't even know who's getting married. <laughs> we do know they ran out of wine. Maybe they ran out of wine because the bridegroom had poor planning. Maybe they ran out of wine because the groom simply didn't have the financial means to supply as much as he would have liked. We don't really know why, but regardless, the wine ran out. Now, in the grand scheme of things, how big a deal is that? <laughs> yeah, it'd be embarrassing. It would be, uh, I don't know, it would be kind of irritating. But in the grand scheme of things, not a, that big a deal, really. It's not like somebody got seriously sick. It's not like somebody died. It's not like uh, there was a calamity that occurred. You ran out of wine. The party's done. <laughs> not that big a deal. But concerning this little thing, Mary goes to Jesus. They have no wine. <laughs> now, Jesus' answer to her is a little bit terse, it seems, doesn't it? Martin Chemnitz thinks that this is because Mary seemed to be trying to use her motherly influence to direct Jesus in his public office as Messiah. You know, moms can do this, right? <laughs> they can simply say, hey, did you notice this? And really, it's, it's the mom guilt to say, you're supposed to do something about it, right? <laughs> and Jesus' response is like, no, you can't tell me what to do as the Messiah. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm the Messiah. I know what I'm going to do, and I know what I'm supposed to do. And Mary can go to Jesus asking for help just like the rest of us, but she can't tell Jesus what to do as the Messiah, even as his mother. But then, did you notice the rest of the response that Jesus has? He says, my hour has not yet come. Which is a, the kind of thing he says towards the end of his ministry when he's pointing forward to the crucifixion. My hour has not yet come. He's anticipating the crucifixion and the resurrection, but that's not really what he's getting at here, I don't think. I actually, I love how Martin Chemnitz answers this. Here's what he writes. You see, Mary thought that this was the hour to provide help before the wine was totally gone and the guests find out about this and the groom becomes upset or ashamed in the presence of his guests. However, Jesus responded, my hour has not yet come. Rather, when the wine has been drained to the last drop, when everything has become upset and nearly hopeless, that then is Christ's hour. In this way, he makes the miracle more memorable than if he forestalled the failure of the wine. <laughs> Jesus says, my hour is not yet come, because it's, well, let it become a little more desperate. <laughs> let, let it become apparent that there's no other way that this is going to be happening except that I'm going to meet this need. And sometimes the Lord does this with us, doesn't he? And he teaches us so that we rely on him rather than relying upon ourselves. Now, after Jesus responds to Mary, she, she in turn shows just fantastic faith. She turns to the servants, and what does she tell them? She tells them what, what words that we should take to heart. Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Do whatever Jesus tells you. Really good advice, right? Do whatever Jesus tells you. Well, what does Jesus tell them to do? Fill the jars with water. Simple enough, right? Turn on the water spigot. Get the hose, right? 
Not so much. <laughs> How are they going to have to fill these water jars? Six stone jars, 20 or 30 gallons each. The servants are going to have to go down to the well, draw the water up, carry the water all the way back, pour the water into these big containers again and again and again until they're full. Uh, this is not going to be a light day of work. <laughs> This is going to be a lot of labor on their part, isn't it? Water's heavy. Water is not very fun to carry. And they're going to have to go to the well, draw it, pour it in again and again until six containers, 20 or 30 gallons each, are filled. But the servants show great faith here, too, really. They don't complain. They don't say, oh, I don't want to do that. Are you Really? They don't even seem to ask a question about it. They just do it. And then Jesus says, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the feast. And they do. And I wonder, as, as they're taking the water, now become wine, but they don't know this necessarily yet, what are they thinking? You know, are they thinking... Why am I bringing water to this guy to drink? He's going to think I'm a crazy person. I don't know. I don't know what, he's, what they're thinking as they're carrying this, but they go and do it. They bring it to the master of the feast, and what does the master of the feast say? Everyone, who ser everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now, don't miss here how this is pointing us forward to the Lord's Supper. The water becomes wine, and what is the water that becomes wine? What is it held in? These big containers that are used for purification rites. <laughs> what happens in the Lord's Supper? The bread and the wine are now the body and blood of Christ, and we have the purification that God gives to us. That's a big part of what's being pointed forward to in this event. Also, don't miss this. We talked about this with Bo. That's, what does John call this? He doesn't say, this was the first miracle of Jesus. It's okay to call it that. It was that. But what does he call it? A sign. This, the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Well, why does he call it a sign? <laughs> because signs reveal things. Signs tell us things. This sign shows us, tells us who this Jesus is. Yes, he's God, just as we talked about in the children's message. This Jesus is God in human flesh. Nobody else can do this. This Jesus is the Messiah, the one that has been uh, foretold by the prophets, right? But this, this sign revealing Jesus as God, as the Messiah, also reveals this God, this Messiah. <laughs> he cares about those little things, doesn't he? He doesn't say, well, you know, this is not a big deal. You know, they'll get past this. They'll get over this. There's more important things. I've got to go and, and heal the sick. I've got to go give sight to the blind. I've got to go raise the dead. I've got to go do my Messiah stuff. He's right there. They ask him for help. What does he do? He helps. There is nothing so small that you shouldn't bring it to Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7 reminds us, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. There's nothing so small that you should think, you know, I, I'm not going to bother God with this. He's got bigger things to deal with. Well, I'm sure he does. And he's perfectly capable of dealing with those bigger things and your little thing at the same time. Notice also this sign reveals to us that Jesus is worthy of our trust. What does John write at the very end here? And his disciples believed in him. <laughs> Why does Jesus do these signs? Well, there's, there's really two reasons. First, he genuinely is there to help. He wants to help. So when he 
heals the sick, when he gives sight to the blind, when he uh, allows the deaf to hear, he genuinely wants to help these people, and he does. Secondarily, though, it also confirms who he is. You see these miracles, and people say, ah, this is the Messiah. This is the one that God has sent. And he is the one who overcomes sin, death, and the devil. And so, yes, we will have everlasting life. We will have all of our, uh, our diseases of sin taken care of. But even now, even now, he's, he's caring about us and caring for us. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's be like Mary. Oh, here's a, here's a little thing. What are we going to do? We're going to go to Jesus. Mary knew Jesus and, of course, knew he would help. You know Jesus too, don't you? And so when a problem arises, when a need shows up, when a desire is there, we too can go to Jesus. And he will help in his time and in his way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.